Uh, so a digital Kapler Myers uh, are not going to be enough here. We need the linked progression and death data uh, for each patient. Uh, the package will then fit, a, as others do, uh, the package will then fit a range of parametric and spline models to those three endpoints. Uh, also, the pre-progression death and post-progression survival under clock forward and clock reset formulations. So the user then selects which fits to use for each of the endpoints. That's deliberately slightly manual because it's quite an important choice. Uh, and after that selection, the package will then calculate the likelihood and a khaki and Bayesian information criteria statistics for the four model structures, uh, clock forward and clock reset state transition models and simple and complex partition survival models. Uh, hang on, what do, we, what do I mean by the two different partition survival model structures? Well, the likelihood is not really fully defined uh, without some assumption for pre as opposed to post progression mortality. Uh, so the simple approach here considers as many spreadsheet economic models already do, uh, that the hazard of progression is proportional to the number of progression events relative to death events in the composite PFS endpoint. Uh, the complex approach simply requires a hazard function for time to progression, um, so as to calculate pre-progression hazard also. Uh, so with our preferred set of endpoint models, we can now calculate the restricted mean durations in each model state for each model structure, and, and therefore evaluate uh, structural uncertainty. Uh, and all, by the way, without leaving R. Um, we can then also consider constraining extrapolations for background mortality. Uh, just a little bit more on what I mean by constraining uh, background mortality. Um, so we, we don't want our projections of uh, life expectancy in this diseased population to be any greater than background or general life expectancy. Uh, background mortality, uh, perhaps adjusted through a, an assumed standardized mortality ratio, should constrain those projections. And, and there are at least three different approaches one can take here. Uh, firstly, the simplest, we can just constrain the survival function. That's relatively simple and has been used in at least one recent NICE technology appraisal as sweeting uh, identified. Uh, but it doesn't, doesn't ensure that the mortality hazard in each, uh, is at least as great as in the background. So method two does exactly that. It constrains the hazard directly. And, and that's our method two here. Uh, and once we have the hazard constrained, we can then derive the survival. And the, the third approach is, is excess hazard uh, modeling, in which the mortality observed in the patient level data set is modeled as in excess of an assumed background mortality. And this has been described in a really valuable recent tutorial paper by Sweeting and colleagues at AstraZeneca and the universities of Leicester and Sheffield. And this potentially implies different survival models in every health system with its own mortality data and might be another nail in the coffin of a concept of a global economic model. Uh, however, this step might seem rather unnecessary given one of the conclusions of the work was that uh, life table misspecification had a minimal effect on restricted mean survival time differences. So moving on to the application in, in this package. So we're talking about the, the method two approach here where we're constraining the hazard directly. Uh, so unfortunately, we need to drop the integral formula at this point and use discrete, discretized calculations by time step, like a spreadsheet. Uh, uh, like, a, like a spreadsheet. Um, so the package derives pre and post progression death hazards under each model structure, and then we can adjust those calculations following the, the, the method to ensuring that the pre and post progression mortality function, uh, hazard functions are appropriately constrained uh, when deriving the uh, restricted mean durations. So take a look at some results. Uh, this is, uh, so it's an illustrative data set with an illustrative life table behind it as well, uh, applying the constraint. So this is a state transition model clock forward. Um, so using the integral methods without a mortality constraint, our illustrative data set produces estimates of 270 weeks in progression-free and 399 weeks uh, alive. Uh, using the discretized calculations doesn't change the results too much, which is good, uh, reducing the estimate by less than one day. Then applying the mortality constraint um, reduces the progression-free estimate by 40 weeks and the time alive by 52 weeks. So in this model structure, the effect of the mortality constraint is, is uh, pretty substantial. Looking at the clock reset approach, we see very similar uh, results. Again, the discretized results are similar to the integral calculations. 
and applying a mortality constraint again reduces the progression free estimate by 40 years and the time alive by 52 uh, sorry by 40 weeks and the time alive by 52 weeks moving to the partition survival model um, we have again the discretized discretized results are similar to the integral calculations 274 and 393 the time in progression free is a little bit longer, four weeks longer than in the state transition models. Uh, under the partition survival model, the progression free time is reduced by 39 weeks and time alive by 52 weeks. And under the complex partition survival model, because that has a slightly different hazard uh, between um, pre and um, post um, uh, progression mortality, um, the, the effect of the constraint is, is slightly different, in this case, greater. Uh, the, the Progression-free estimate is reduced by 43 weeks and the time alive by 48 weeks. So um, what can we take of this? this? This analysis of an entirely fictional data set constrained by an entirely fictional life table. Can we, can we take anything? Well, I, I think we can. Uh, I think we see here uh, in, in calculations that can be easily run from R with one package and one data set, uh, you, you can quickly see that the if, if effect the, the effect of the background mortality constraint, and that it depends on multiple factors. Certainly the data you're fitting, the background mortality you're assuming, including any standardized mortality ratio assumption. It also depends on what economic model structure we're using. And, and here we had four in this quite simple example. Uh, of course, it depends. It will depend on what constraining assumption we're, we're making and uh, whether we should use the constraint of only the survival function, method one, or as here, the hazard function directly, method two. Um, or, and we should also consider whether we're, we might be better modeling excess hazard more explicitly uh, as, as outlined in the, the sweeting paper. So conclusions and next steps. Certainly I think further research will be valuable to identify best practices in what methods of and reporting for restricted mean survival time estimates that allow for background mortality. Uh, ideally, we'd want to compare our projections, uh, long-term country-specific projections with, from our models with corresponding real-world real data, adjusting for any baseline differences in the populations uh, and, and see how well they do. Um, could our projections be validly improved by alternate methods of accounting for background mortality? Or, or is that just overfitting? Uh, could separating disease-specific mortality from other cause, could that be helpful? Or, or not, given the, the challenges in the signing cause of death. Uh, when is excess hazard mortality, sorry, when is excess hazard modeling necessary? And, and when is it, if you'll pardon the pun, just excessive? How should mortality adjustments properly be made in the economic models? Are survival constraints still okay, method one, or should we really be moving to the method two or something more sophisticated? And what background mortality should be used? Remember, this is a diseased population that doesn't necessarily, shouldn't necessarily expect to follow the, the general population. It should, in terms of the life tables we're using, should they be cohort or calendar year, year based? And what standardized mortality ratio should we be assuming? So I'm afraid I end with perhaps more questions than I, that I even started with. Um, otherwise, I would just say I'm very grateful for uh, the uh, feedback received on the package so far, and and uh, really appreciate any any more that anyone has here. Uh, I'd particularly be interested in whether it, whether the package provides a useful additional quality check on spreadsheet model calculations, and if there's any other features uh, that would be valuable to, to add to it. And uh, before I open for questions, I'd many thanks to several colleagues uh, along the way uh, who have been really helpful with this with this project. Ray Fung Zhu and Abdel Hamisi. Uh, on the analysis of the Keynote 826 data, Ross McConaughey, Ralph and Singer, Rob Hettle, reviewers and editor of the journal on, on reviewing the, um, the the methods and the, the paper, Nan Xiao and John Blissack, my colleagues uh, on R programming, Nal Davison, Brad Kivett of Maple Health Group for review of the R package code when it was uh, an, an earlier version on GitHub, and my colleagues, Matt Monberg and, and Don Yin, and of course, the patients and investigators of Keynote 826. I, I sound like I'm at the Oscars. I don't mean it to be like that. Um, but let me stop there and um, op open for um, questions. So uh, thanks very much, uh, Dominic. I hope everybody can, uh, can hear me clearly enough. Uh, it's nice to get into detail on a topic that I think maybe a lot of people will 
we'll sort of just put into the background or just, you know, default with some of those easy assumptions, but it's important to understand, you know, where it can make a difference and not. I mean, I think the example where you show that in some cases it doesn't, and maybe it's not something to lose sleep over or useful, but in other cases, definitely it's something to, it's uh, something to think about and it's nice to be able to explore it with, with good examples. Um, so, um, yeah, I want to open it up to the floor if anybody's got any particular questions. Um, and I, I, usually it's nice for people just to hop in, unmute themselves. And, and it's nice if people can turn their cameras on as well. I think it just makes the questions easier. But if people have questions in the chat as well, we definitely encourage those. And even if people don't have a question right now, you know, I, I'm sure all the speakers are happy to, to entertain questions that might come up afterwards. So does, does anybody want to unmute themselves and hop in with a question? So I see Howard has got a question um, there. Do you want to, Howard, I always think it's, it's best if you want to just articulate the question uh, for everybody's okay, sure. benefit. Hi, hi, Dominic. Um, thanks for a very interesting presentation on a really common problem. Um, I think you were using IPD from one trial. So it does require that. And then it tests assumptions against the relationships between progression-free survival, post-progression survival, et cetera, in that data set. Does this extend then to cases where you have IPD from one trial but only aggregate data from others, so you don't actually know the true relationship between PPS, PFS, OS, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, no, yeah thank you for the, the, the question and, and, and interest. Um, so the, the, the manuscript describes analysis of Keynote 826 trial data. Uh, this, this presentation uh, has uh, fictional data for the, the purposes of, of this exercise. Um, but yes, you you need it's the relationship between the progression and the death on an individual basis that's that's really important. So you, you need that IPD that includes progression and death deaths information for each each patient. So if you just had the aggregate data uh, that or, or even you know a couple of myographic, unfortunately that's not going to be sufficient. It's, Which is unfortunately the the main situation yeah. when you need to apply partition survival models. Yes. Well, yeah. I mean, unless you uh work for a sponsor as as yeah which which has or, or have access to the the patient level data okay we've got another question from from uh, may chan so may if you if you're happy to, to to come forward and ask the question uh please do um but just if you're scrambling for the mic i might just uh, i might just start oh sorry in a busy office okay so may says uh sorry if i've missed this have has there been any guidance or regulations published by hda agencies on accounting for background mortality um, and I suppose I'm, I guess I'm thinking about NICE in the first instance, and since they tend to be the most detailed and then everybody else tends to follow. But Dominic, do you have any experience of this being picked up by the agencies? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any very specific guidance that I have seen. I'm willing, very willing to be corrected on, on that. I haven't seen any anything too specific. And, and I, instead I see in submissions that are made, maybe a variety of different approaches that are uh submitted and critiqued to different ways and have you ever have you been involved in any submissions where you've had any feedback for, from um from the expert reviewers who've said you know we weren't happy you we, you've done it this way we'd rather you did that or yes I'm, I'm thinking about those in the in the in the public domain um so so yeah I, I think reviewers have been very keen to ensure that the where we've used um uh markov models that the that the appropriate it's the appropriate transition probabilities are, are constrained. And, um, uh, you know, if you've constrained a composite transition, like a PFS uh, transition with a mortality, uh, uh, with a life table constraint, that's that's not good because you, you, you're you over constraining uh, in, in that circumstance, a, a composite endpoint that includes progression and death with a life table that just reflects death. So, so that's been a, I've seen that uh, critique come up mm -hmm. i mean i think it's interesting when reviewers give comments and but it isn't reflected in guidance you know i always think that's a little bit unfair on on, on you know it wastes a little bit of time and it, and it doesn't allow for the dissemination of good methods but i mean I, I, hopefully uh, this will get reflected in guidance but that's a that's a nice question may thanks very much for for putting that in i don't see any further questions in the chat if i if i'm not mistaken um so unless anybody wants to quickly unmute themselves and come in and have a further question. I might just ask you, Dominic, is there anything else that you want to elaborate on or you, 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 any other final points you'd just like to make before you finish up? No, that, no, that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present and some uh, great questions also. Lovely. Thanks very much, Dominic.